A Musical Life with modern classical and film composer Carrie Muzzy. Carrie Muzzy is the composer for The Seer, a new documentary by director Laura Dunn and executive producers Robert Redford and Terence Malick that just premiered at the 2016 South by Southwest Film Festival. Carrie's music has also been heard on TV shows like Glee. His 2014 album, The Architect, debuted at number five on both the Billboard Classical and Contemporary Classical charts. This episode of A Musical Life is brought to you by A Musical Life Mastermind. You know, every year, thousands of music students graduate from conservatories and music programs. Thousands of musicians compete for fewer jobs that pay less and struggle to find gigs or quality private students to make a living. If you're looking for a better way to find a career or make a living as a musician, I'd like to invite you to check out A Musical Life Mastermind. A Musical Life Mastermind is a place where musicians meet to share ideas and support each other to achieve success. To get started with a free ebook on the number one resource you need to grow your music, visit amusicallifemastermind.com. Once again, that web address is amusicallifemastermind.com. Dot com. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. We're continuing our special series on musical entrepreneurs with film and modern classical composer Carrie Muzzy. If you're a composer looking to make a living from your compositions, then you're going to really enjoy listening to Carrie's story. One of the most remarkable things about Carrie is the fact that he actually left a well-paying corporate job at MTV Networks in New York City to become a full-time composer. The way he did it, and the way he was able to get his music into TV and film, is very insightful. Carrie's music is full of atmosphere and intimate passion, perfectly suited for telling stories on the big screen. Let's start by listening to an excerpt from one of his tracks for Laura Dunn's documentary, The Seer, titled... Winter. Carrie, welcome to the show. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you. I am really excited to be doing this. I think we have a lot to talk about. (laughs) I definitely want to explore your music and your sound world. And one of the questions I like to ask composers is if you can give some recommendations of music that you've written to help everybody get a sense of your musical style and the sounds that you work with. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Um, there's some older stuff that, you know, I'm not wild about anymore. <laughs> I, it's funny how you, you know, the more you do, the more you progress. Of but course. then the downside is that your first attempts are still out there. <laughs> um, I would say if you want something to go to right away, yeah. there's an album called The Architect that ah. I put out uh, late 2014. We're going to talk about that album in depth too, but that's great. Sure. I, I'm, I'm very proud of that one.
And then the other one that's a good um, kind of cross section is called Trailer Music Three. Ah. Uh, and there's a couple scores too. Like I have, there's a score for um, a film called Hole in the Paper Sky, mm. uh, which is something we can talk about later too. But it's it's one of those things that I'm especially proud of. So I'd say dip into those, screen through like the most popular downloaded tracks on iTunes and see what you think. <laughs> very, very cool. Excellent. Um, so I actually had a chance to uh, listen to a good bit of your music. And it's interesting. My impressions were that your music seems to reflect a lot of intimacy and a lot of inner reflection, as well as this infectious hope and optimistic joy. It help, I can't help wondering, of course, music is oftentimes a reflection of the character of the one who creates it. And I'm wondering, is your music a reflection, the, the intimacy, inner reflection, hope, and joy? Is that a reflection of your character and life experiences? I, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I just sense I, this wonderful optimism in your writing, as well as this very intimate, there's this intimacy, beautiful intimacy that I hear in so many of your tracks. Thank you. I, I guess it's, um, how do I say, I'd say when I was younger, like a teenager and writing music, it was much more tortured and kind of self. <laughs> sure. You know, you're, you're a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your whole life is self-indulgence. Mm. Um, now I, I'm hoping that it's I've refined that a little bit and it's not as in your face, but I've always loved movie music. And so that's sort of the style I automatically wrote in. Mm -hmm. um, some some of it's kind of dark. Some I guess some of it's really pretty. Even if it's kind of, kind of dark, there is always a little bit of a hopeful quality. I think because when I'm if I'm if I'm writing something that that's dark because I'm in a bad place. Mm. Um, it tends to not work. So I always write that stuff after I'm out of the bad place, which I think might be why there's always some optimism in there. It's almost like it's a part of mental processing or emotional purging or something. Interesting. So would it be safe to say that in general, you are an optimistic person? I am. <laughs> I am. If I, yeah, I mean, you know, there, everybody has bad days, but ultimately, I'm just, uh, if, if there's the tortoise and the hare, I am completely the tortoise and I just keep on going. Mm, um, mm. I've been really fortunate and there's not a day that goes by that I don't say thank you universe for letting this work. Mm, mm, wonderful. Now I want to congratulate you. You've written the music to a documentary called The Seer, which at the time of the recording of this podcast just premiered at South by Southwest a few days ago. Yeah. Um, this is a film a documentary film that was produced by Robert Redford, among other producers. I'm wondering if you could tell us the yeah. premise of the documentary and some of the challenges maybe that you faced in creating the score for this. I guess it's an Americana tale, yes? Uh, it kind of is. <clears throat> it's a story about, well, it's, it's a documentary, uh, like a full-length 90-minute documentary um, by the filmmaker Laura Dunn, who is the director, editor, and producer of it. This is her baby. Wow. And yeah, she's been working on it for seven or eight years. Oh, my goodness. Um, and her executive producers were Robert Redford and Terrence Malick, who also EP'd her first film called The Unforeseen, mm -hmm. which is another documentary that she took years and years to make. Um, so The Seer is about, it's about what's happening in rural America today and how the, um, this way of life that's always been very traditionally American, which is the small farm and people who work the land, it's disappearing there's this entire agrarian culture that's disappearing because of things like industrialized agriculture, where the only way to stay afloat now is to buy another or rent another thousand acres of land so that you can afford to get 
the machine that will help you to just break even. Um, and in the meantime, they're living their lives kind of right on the edge of bankruptcy. And But the whole thing takes place through the eyes of an American um, poet and writer named Wendell Berry, who I didn't know anything about, but he, they, and they actually say in the movie, like 50% of people live and breathe by your every word. And 50% of people have never heard of you. Um, if you're uh, a writer, a poet, if you are did like a literature degree in college, you probably read him. Hmm. But um, I wasn't familiar. And so it's not a biopic about him um, as much as it is looking at the state of where he lives, which is Henry County, Kentucky, through his eyes and through these decades of his writings, is there a solution to the problem that these farmers face? Mm. Now, is he a farmer himself or is he just a poet? He is. He is a farmer, grew up on a farm um, his entire life in Henry County, Kentucky, and then took a break for a while where he went to be um, a professor and sort of a writer in residence at places like Stanford and uh, Columbia, I think that's a pretty a cool couple, place to take a break. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And he, but he went for a while and did, you know, like fellowships or teaching gigs at universities, um, because he was very in demand. This was like sixties and seventies. Mm. And then he decided that he didn't want to do that. He just wanted to be back on the farm. Mm. Um, and it's at, when you're describing this to someone, it's a very long elevator pitch, honestly, because it's a little bit hard to describe. And it's not the most exciting tagline in the world. But once you actually see the story and the way it's told, because Laura is just, she's the most amazing filmmaker. Uh, the stuff she makes is absolutely gorgeous. Mm. And it, um, you get so sucked into the story and to the people. Because the characters in this film are just people who basically have the farms around uh, Wendell's farm. There are people all in his area who are experiencing the same thing. And mm. some have taken different paths. So there are some people who have found a solution and there's some people who are still trapped in this never ending cycle. Mm. So I imagine given, I'm just trying to imagine myself as a composer seeing this amazing film, were you brought on early in the project or after the film had been already shot and edited? Um, kind of both. Oh, it was it was like a year and a half or two years before. Well, I would say that Laura's been shooting and editing it for six or seven years. Wow. Um, because they were shooting, they wanted to capture all four seasons in Henry County. So she would go out periodically to do more shooting and more interviews. And um, it was about two years ago that she hit me up because I had some music that was used, just licensed music in her first film, The Unforeseen. And we stayed in touch after that because mm. um, I had the chance to meet her at one of the premieres of that. And I really liked her. I just really, I, I know what it takes to make something like a documentary and to do the whole thing by yourself. And I was just kind of impressed that she was so nice. Wow. She was like a truly nice, earnest, kind person. And it's amazing when somebody can be that nice and still like move a mountain. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, so it's like a year and a half or two years ago. She said, uh, I'm working on this film. Do you have some new music that you could send me? Because she tends to use just licensed music and she edits to it. I see. And I had had so much stuff since she and I last worked together. Plus, I had launched the Candle Park Stars and I just sent her this massive download. Like it's loosely categorized in folders. See what you think. This is all <laughs> kind of the this, this stuff that you would normally like. Hmm. Um, so initially it was just a couple, it was going to be a couple licensed things. And then it was, uh, now just to explain for our audience, licensed tracks are tracks that you've just recorded and you upload and anybody can use them. They just buy them and then they could be licensed to use them in their movies and their, what, in, in any of their productions, they just, they purchase a license to add your tracks, your, your, your music to their projects. Is that correct? Yeah. I think mm -hmm. the easiest way to think of it is that it's permission to use someone's music in your video. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, there were a few things that she wanted to license and, uh, then it was just, it was like last May, maybe she was just about to finish the cut. And she said, 
that she really wanted a, like a consistent musical through line. Mm. So in addition to these couple of pieces that she had like as sort of goalposts in there, would I be willing to do the original score? Wow. And I jumped at that one. Like that's <laughs> you, it's a composer's dream. You don't get asked to do things that are this good, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, then it all happened kind of quickly. I got the, the locked picture and I had about three or four weeks on it. Wow. Wow. That is fantastic. So really it was this friendship that you had started almost serendipitously, not even directly in that you maintained it. It's so cool that, that how this came about. It, it really was. Um, I mean, she lives in Austin. She's based there. So I never would have had occasion to meet her except that I used to live in New York and um, this so her, the unforeseen had premiered at Sundance and then it won the Indie spirit award for uh, truer than fiction. I don't know if that's their best documentary award, wow. but that's what it got. Wow. So then it did a little, a little tour around the U S mm -hmm. and one of the stops was at the MoMA in New York. Mm -hmm. So I went to the screening and got to meet her just very briefly, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of like, when you're struck by somebody in just two minutes of conversation, yeah. it kind of, it sticks with you. Mm. Mm. And you, but you knew that she had been using your music for that particular film, right? Yeah. Yeah. She used a few pieces. Um, How cool. <laughs> her, her style is very less is more. Mm. And that's kind of, um, the music gets really tricky with documentary because it's so completely different than, you know, a narrative film. We all have a, a direct narrative. You're almost there's a there's a story arc which the music I suppose needs to try to emulate in some fashion. Is that right? That's totally it. Mm. When you're when you're going to see like a I don't know something romantic or a period film or an action film or whatever, the music has a really specific purpose. I see. Yeah. And and as an audience person, you expect that. You know exactly what's going to happen. It's like the horror movie music that makes you jump. <laughs> But, right. you know, when, when you're an audience member for that kind of movie, let's say you're going to see like a period piece like Atonement or one of those movies, you you know what you're in for. And, you know, there's going to be like the tragic loss and there's going to be soaring strings. The couple's finally going to get together and it's going to be slow motion and there's going to be soaring strings. It, But you're OK with that because that's part of the ride that you have put yourself on, mm. you know, yeah. whereas documentary, it's really and I, I kind of didn't even discover this until I started this film documentary is much trickier because it has to be honest. It has to be really legit. And if you try to do manipulative things with the music or try to use music in a way that you'd use it with a narrative film, it just, it, it kind of adds too much color to the picture. Interesting. And instead of supporting it, it tells you how you're supposed to feel about it. Mm. You really, you have to avoid that sort of thing with documentary because People are smarter than that, you know, like you have a documentary audience who knows that they're seeing something factual. And I think they're automatically on high alert for, am I being sold something? Is this really true? Um, they're not there to be manipulated so much in the way that you would be in a narrative film. They're there to learn something. Hmm. Where did you learn this? Was this something a mentor taught you? Is this something that just came instinctively, this, this instinct the care with which you approach the documentary scoring as opposed to a TV or a narrative film. How did, where did you get that instinct to be so conscientious about the emotional impact or the restraint of as you scored this film? I, I learned that at the beginning of scoring this film because I kept screwing up the opening, like the, the first cue I was working on. Yeah. And I was, I, you know, it's some, I, I would dive into this. Well, I should say that I, when I watched it, I loved it. And I was really excited about it. And I was, I jumped in and I was, you know, all systems go. I'm going to score the hell out of this thing. It's going to be gorgeous. And um, my first pass at the first cue, it, it was beautiful. It was great. I kind of, I wish I had saved it, but it was so wrong. And the next morning I'm watching it back. Like, why is this not working? Oh, it's, yeah. it's so dis like, it's so is not doing the right thing. What exactly is going on here? Mm. And it took me a couple passes. And then all of a sudden I realized what I was doing, which was scoring the beauty of this thing with beauty. And I was serving it to you, the viewer with a spoon, mm. you know, like here, here's here. Look how gorgeous this is. Isn't this gorgeous? And 
um, I think that's when I just kind of ran into a wall and realized that I was doing the wrong thing. So some of the stuff came out to be at my first pass, it was way too heavy and too sad. Um, and then I realized like, Oh, I'm not, this is actually kind of a hopeful film and I'm writing it like it's a, a eulogy, like it's a drama mm. or something. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's funny, it sounds great the day that you do it, but then the next morning when you watch it, you have much clearer eyes. Interesting. So I really only figured that out by doing it wrong a couple times on this one. Um, and through Laura's notes, her very first note on the first cue I sent was perfect. And she said, we have to be really careful with music not to be too sentimental, too nostalgic, too melancholy, or too emotional. Interesting. And that was the note that governed everything. Because ultimately, even if this film had had zero music in it at all, it could have stood on its own. It really could have because the stories were so compelling and the people in it are just good salt of the earth people. And that comes right off the screen at you. Mm. So it kind of became about doing no harm. Yeah. And in fact, I, I actually put a, a post-it note right on my monitor that said, do no harm. <laughs> so that it was constantly always in front of me because it truly was like my film to screw up. Mm. Wow. What a fascinating insight into the creative process. I really appreciate you sharing that with our listeners. It's just amazing. Oh, I love talking about it. And I would say if you want to see a really good, um, this was actually one of the things that I did to put myself in check <clears throat> is that HBO did um, a documentary about uh, Prop 8 a year or two ago that was scored by the composer Blake Neely, who does tons of TV stuff. Um, I went back and rewatched that to see how he treated music in that documentary because I remember being really struck by it. Mm. It was the perfect background and the perfect tone. So if you want a, a good example, if you have any composer listeners out there, I would say um, go watch the HBO Prop 8 documentary because it, the way he treats music in there is kind of the, the gold standard. Interesting. And that really helped nudge me, excuse me, nudge me back into line. Thank you so much for that recommendation. I'll make sure to include a link to that in the show notes, in addition to the links, of course, to your music as well. Now, we already mentioned the movies that you've written some music for, like Hole in the Paper Sky, What Happens Next, and Holiday Engagement. You've also written some music for the TV show Glee. I'm wondering if you could share how you got your start in the film and TV industry. I know this is something that so many composers dream of. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, I, the first thing I would mention is that about Glee, I was not the show composer and I, I didn't write, didn't write music specifically for the show. Ah. I always like to be clear about that because I'm not, I'm not stealing any thunder from Jim Levine, who was mm -hmm. the show composer. Um, okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, that yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Glee was actually a license deal. Like we talked about before where the producers found a piece of music they wanted to use. Um, so they would get my permission and they would pay a fee and then they could use the music. Um, it was an amazing and very lucky thing. Wow. But as for how I got my start, um, I, I did a couple indie projects many years ago, like early 2000s. But at the same time, I was working at MTV Networks in New York in the business affairs department. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. wait, um, wait let, let's back up for a second. MTV, I mean, that's, that is so cool. So, But you weren't, I mean, when I think of MTV, I think, you know, rock and roll, you know, the latest pop and and, 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 and yeah. R&B and hip hop. So you were, but you were working on the business end of it? Yeah, for VH1 specifically. Whoa, um, how cool. I was there for 11 years. It was a very, very cool job. Yeah. Well, I think what people don't realize is that when you're watching these shows, like, uh, was popular at the time. I love the eighties. I love the seventies, <laughs> uh, behind the music, all those things. Yeah. What you don't realize is that, you know, as you're watching all these old clips and hearing this old music and you've got all these like nuggets of pop culture history is that for every single thing that you saw and heard, someone had to get permission and put a contract in place. Oh and that goodness. was me and my department. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very, very <clears throat> cool. I'm going to have to ask you, you now you've kind of totally revamped my, my whole questionnaire thing. <laughs> Cause I didn't, I never, no, I, I had no idea that you worked in, in, in the corporate side of the music industry. How fascinating. I did. Um, it, you know, it, I worked with really cool people. It, it was a very great, it was a good place to work. And yeah. um, I guess for my own personal path, mm. the thing that I really got out of it was for a composer, 
and somebody who, who lives in the realm of intellectual property, all the different avenues that money come from. Because when it comes down to it, scoring jobs are probably where the least amount of money comes from, which is a really tough thing to wrestle with when you want to be someone who scores film and TV. So you kind of have to figure out how all the pieces fit together so that when you take that leap to become a full-time composer person, you know that there's a certain amount of income that you can rely on and you know where to spend your time so that you can have income coming in, basically so that you can afford to take on a scoring project, which may not pay a lot of money. That's completely the opposite of what I think most composers are led to believe. I think a lot of composers think that they're going to make a living getting commissions, getting hired and being paid to write X number of minutes of music at maybe $1,000 a minute or something like that. And you're saying it's really the opposite that creates a sustainable living. It's completely the opposite. And sustainable is the key word here. Um, that before you take that leap to make it a full-time thing, you should have your ducks in a row and understand exactly how much money you will be making absent any scoring gigs. Um, and that's through music libraries, that's through iTunes sales. For some people, it's live shows. Um, it can be commissions. It's licensing. It's all these different things. And um, I've known some composer people who never really, they were kind of starting out and they didn't realize that. And um, it, step one is understanding where all of the different income streams come from. And there are so many, and it really is about knowing what to sign and what not to sign. Because mm. um, somebody who's doing a little indie film score and maybe getting $500 for it, they might sign something that turns the rights over to the producer, mm -hmm. which is not something you would do for an indie project that's only paying you 500 bucks. But for example, if you kept those rights, you could then put that soundtrack out on iTunes and somebody could find it. Um, you can license the music to someone. You can give that music to a music library who can then place it in TV shows. There's so many different avenues. Um, so I always looked at it. I, I, I guess I attacked it as with a business plan where I made myself an accounts receivable calendar so that I knew that, you know, these are the months when ASCAP and BMI will pay out performance royalties for TV uses. If I have stuff in a music library, this is where these are the months where that payment will happen. This is kind of how much I can guess that it will be. This is how much sales I will get per month on iTunes. And you add it up and it really just comes down to, can I pay the rent and pay my health insurance <laughs> and everything with this much money coming in? Hmm. And the other thing I tell people is that if you're thinking about doing this, um, you must, and this is, this is a tough one, before you make the leap, you must have, without exception, one year's worth of your living expenses in the bank mm. must mm. like if you don't then don't do it um and you also have to have all these different wheels already in motion and i would say in motion at least a couple years before you decide to take this leap um you see you're better off like transitioning slowly into it and having money in the bank uh knowing that you know there's the possibility that you really could make it work and make more, but there's also the possibility that it's not going to take off like you think, and you want to be prepared for that. So if I'm inferring correctly, you actually made a decision to leave a great corporate job, and I'm assuming it paid pretty well, at one of the biggest music industry companies, MTV. You made a decision to leave what, what, what I would perhaps look at it as a comfortable position to become a full-time composer, that must have taken a tremendous amount of courage. I'm wondering what inspired you to make such a drastic shift and, frankly, a leap of courage. It sounds so nice when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, look, whenever, whenever somebody, when you're doing a job that doesn't fit you, mm. You're okay with the discordance of that um, as long as you're getting something out of it and you work with good people and that kind of thing. And as you get a little bit older, your perspective changes. And I was 35 and I, for me, the fives have always been tough ages. Like 25 was hard. 30 was fine. 35 was hard. 
40 was fine. <laughs> so I was 35 and I was, you know, they had been through a couple different layoffs and restructuring and all that thing. And it was, it was getting harder and harder for me to stay there and enjoy it. Mm. Um, because I realized that like I'm getting older and I'm still not doing this thing that I always wanted to be doing. Mm. Um, and I had been saving money as a buffer. Um, and it, it really was like a, a life decision where a couple people told me I was nuts. A couple people said, I think it's going to work for you. But my gut just said, yeah, I'm climbing the wrong ladder here. I need to, um, I need to step off. And I did, but I will say that I did it knowing what all the different pieces are that, that could make this career. So when I did make that leap, um, I allowed myself like two days off maybe. And then I had pre-planned what my schedule would be, which is no TV until seven o'clock at night. I am at my desk at nine o'clock in the morning and I don't leave it until six. I get 30 minutes for lunch, which I will have at my desk. Like I gave myself a schedule. And I think what I learned really, really quickly is how much you can accomplish when you're spending 50 or 60 hours a week on your own mm. career mm -hmm. versus 50 or 60 hours a week in an office. And with that kind of time investment and being really serious about it, you can make a lot of forward progress, but it's not instant gratification. It really is all about you're planting seeds that will pay off a year and a half, two years down the road, which is why I encourage people to have a good buffer um, in their bank account because there can be lean times. Yeah. There is so much we could delve in on the business end. I'm going to have to have you back on the show, I think, <laughs> to, to help us explore this more. Um, one final question, at least on the business side of things. I'm wondering for composers – the idea of submitting your music into a music library. This is something I really haven't heard much of. Now, I've seen some collections and tracks and sites where you can buy tracks, commercial tracks that you can put in commercials and stuff. What do you mean? Can you maybe just give a little bit more detail or maybe some specific sites or resources where composers can submit their music for these so-called libraries where they can get some of their materials licensed? You know... That's such a giant question okay. <laughs> <clears throat> because there are so many different kinds. Ah. I will say that there, if you want to start looking into it, there's a site called musiclibraryreport.com mm -hmm. where you can see what a lot of the different music libraries are. Realize that they all have different setups. Um, they all have different terms. Like some are the audio jungle pond five kind of things where, you know, pay nine ninety five for this track and you can use it in anything you want forever, as many things as you want. Some are a little bit more traditional music libraries that, you know, TV shows use. You hear this kind of music on Discovery and A&E and all those different networks. Um, also realize, by the way, when you read Music Library Report, there are a lot of people with access to grind. And like any internet forum, you really got to take things with lots of grains of salt. Um, it's kind of like being a savvy reader of Yelp. You have to recognize when someone's information is accurate and when someone's just having a day, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but working with a music library can be a great way to not only bring in income for licensing, but also to trigger ASCAP and BMI uh, performance royalties for television uses which is something that's kind of perpetuating and it just keeps going and going, um, which is really important. Ultimately, with music libraries, it's a volume game. If, if you're working with a traditional library that licenses a lot of music to cable shows, if you have 300, 400 cues in that library, you'll do well. If you have 10 cues, you probably won't. So um, that's what I would say about that, and it definitely is worth a separate conversation about how do composers make money? Mm, mm, mm. Before before we jump any further down the rabbit hole, I want to pull back and refocus on your music because you have this remarkable album, which is the genres described as contemporary classical, called The Architect. 
And it does. It's, yeah. it, I, I, I have to say, I, again, this is all before I knew any of your background about working at MTV and your pop background. I guess the first question is, why contemporary classical as opposed to, you know, heavy metal rock <laughs> or, or something oh, like that? What, what inspired you to, to write in this particular and, and write so beautifully in this particular genre? You know what? I, I can't write pop or rock or, or anything like that to save my soul. And, and I, I, I tried a pop song once and it was so bad. <laughs> no, seriously, you, you get better results out of like an 11 year old with garage band. Than you would me. <laughs> um, I was raised on classical music. Ah. That's pretty much all I listened to till I was about 12 mm -hmm. um, and film scores. And so that's just what I've always written because it's what I like and what I understand. And I'm also classically trained as my degrees in classical piano and I have orchestration and theory and music history and all that kind of stuff as part of that degree. Um, so wh I, what I write naturally wants an orchestra mm. and that's what the architect um, was. It was something that I always, I wanted so much of what I do is done with samples because if you're an independent guy, one of the great things that you can bring to a production, like a small scale film or even a, a TV movie, is to create something that sounds like they actually had a real orchestra working on it. And um, there's a lot of skill involved in like learning how to produce those things and how to create stuff like an orchestra with samples. Uh, and I, and I love doing it, and I think I got pretty good at it. But then there comes a time where I thought, I really just want to like write something legit, something that if I sit in a room for three months and write, this will be the end result. Um, and that's what the architect was for me. It's uh, string orchestra and piano. I recorded it at Air Studios in London, and um, it was me being left alone in my room for about three months to just write and see what I would come up with. And what I came up with is that album. And it, it does, if you play the whole thing together, it does kind of sound like a film's score. It definitely has that vibe about it. But there's also some stuff that has a little bit of a Max Richter-ish modern classical vibe to it. And modern classical has become a very all-encompassing genre name. Sure, so many things huge. can fit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you can you can couch so many things under that. Sure. But ultimately, what what I wanted personally was an album that iTunes would allow onto the classical page on the iTunes Store. Um, that was recorded with real strings. And so that was The Architect. How cool. And I was going to ask you about the titles because it sounds like there is a, a distinctive story arc. I mean, for example, the titles are The Heart Wants, The Secret History, The Architect, An Invincible Summer, Things That Hold Memory. This is an interesting one. Portrait of a Courtesan, Broken People, The Sting of Loss, Every Picture Tells a Story. I mean... Did you have a, a story arc or stories behind each of the, the pieces you composed in this album? With most of them, I did, yeah. Um, I mean, every one is a little bit of a different story. Portrait of a Courtesan is actually... Uh, so I've become kind of like an art and architecture bug as I've traveled more. Um, I go to Italy for my vacations. I love it there. And when you're in Rome, Caravaggio's paintings are everywhere. And if somebody Googles Caravaggio and you look at the pictures, you'll totally recognize them. Um, and Portrait of a Courtesan specifically was, I was writing this, this piece and I didn't really have a name for it or a way to finish the piece. It, it wasn't, the ending wasn't clicking. Um, and whenever that happens, I have a couple big coffee table books of um, Palladian architecture and Caravaggio's paintings. And I look at these things to try and, it takes you out of your head for a minute, you know. Uh, and so I was Googling around for more information about Caravaggio. I saw that there was this one painting of his that has been missing called Portrait of a Courtesan. And it was assumed destroyed in World War II. It's never been seen since. But there was a – photographs of it do exist, so you can look at it online. Mm. But, you know, the painting's long gone. And I thought, oh, wow, what if it wasn't gone? Mm. And then all of a sudden there was my ending. There was my ending for that wow. piece. So I'm like – I'm calling this piece Portrait of a Courtesan. How fascinating.
it's it's always so interesting to hear where artists get their inspirational spark and sometimes it comes from the most random places it's really amazing like coffee table books yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> i love it here there's a recommendation everybody go out and get some more coffee table books <laughs> yeah they, they look pretty and if you're using them for work it's a tax write-off there you go <laughs> awesome great <laughs> great business and great business and art advice all combined into one now i understand that in 2009 you took a break from your scoring duties and you completely jump ship into a complete a different sound world. You started creating a series of cinematic post-rock albums and you actually had created an alias called The Candle Park Stars. First of all, how did you come up with such an awesome evocative name, The Candle Park Stars? I love it. You're so nice to say it that way. <laughs> I I'm telling the truth. I love that name. Honest, I'll tell you the God's honest truth. I took out a legal pad and I just started writing down every random word that came to my mind. It's like refrigerator magnet poetry. <laughs> and I started putting them together in different combinations. And as I found one that I thought I liked, I tried to picture 14-year-old kids saying, what are you listening to? Oh, I'm listening to blah. And when I came up with Candle Park Stars, I pictured someone saying, oh, it's a new Candle Park Stars. Wow. And I was like, oh, that... I, I like the sound of it, but also it it's the name sounds like what the music sounds like. Yeah. And yeah. it so yeah, basically I just put words on a page and then mixed and matched them until uh it made sense. That's all. It's interesting because it evokes three elements that are intimate, yet distant, yet also evocative of 
joyful times, candles and intimate sound, park, where we grow up or we have recreation, the stars, something far, far away. I don't know if you realized that at the time, but I'm just reflecting on the crafting of that name and how it seems to perfectly describe all the things we said at the beginning of the interview, the intimacy, the joy, the optimism, the hoping for something far away, perhaps. And did you realize that at the time? Not with the name, no. But I will say that I, I purposely went into it um, with a couple different very specific rules. One, okay, well, I should say that I, it was at the same time that I discovered post-rock as a genre. Mm -hmm. I discovered explosions in the sky and my, it was like electricity in my brain. It was amazing how just electric guitars could make this stunning music that had such, had such the feeling of uh, a film score to it, but without traditional, you know, film type instruments. Um, so I went into it thinking only joy. That's the, the number one criteria, nothing dark, nothing depressing. It has to be happy and upbeat. And the other is I'm only going to write it when I feel like actually writing it. So, um, anything that is on a candle park stars album is something that came out of inspiration. There was no thought of, uh, well, I have to do another album. So I'll just start writing something. It was more like, I'm in a mood to do this and I need to do it now. Mm. And I originally took it on just because I was sick of my usual shtick. I was really tired of... <laughs> I was going to ask you, what, what caused you to take that break? What, 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 was it, what precipitated that? And I, I should say the break was all of like three or four weeks. Because I wrote <laughs> the first two, album in like, uh, two albums together in maybe three weeks. Wow. Um, no, I had become so obsessed with post-rock. Explosions in the Sky, uh, Godspeed You Black Emperor, Caspian all these different great bands and it was totally outside of what I did, but I wanted to do that. And I was kind of stuck in a rut and I just felt like I was writing the same thing over and over and I was getting better at it, but I wasn't, I don't know. I, I, just, I my heart wasn't completely into it. I needed new inspiration. And as soon as I switched over to this idea of writing what I would call cinematic post rock, is that um, because there was no form, there didn't need to be a form. There didn't need to be like a 20 second intro and then a hit at 40 seconds and then another <laughs> hit at 50 seconds. <clears throat> it could be completely free form. What I found was that it could just evolve. I could just start writing and adding to it. And then all of a sudden, some of these songs turned out to be like eight, nine, 10 minutes long because there didn't need to be a form. Mm. And when it was done and I listened back, I thought, wow, this is good. Like, I actually would listen to this. Because yeah. after I'm done with stuff, I tend to not ever listen to it again. Because mm -hmm. by that time, you're sick of it. <laughs> um, but I will say that all these years later, I still listen to my Candle Park Stars stuff sometimes. Because it's not, I'm not sick of it. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So fascinating. Well, I, I want to switch gears a bit and get into the craft of composition and, and also the education as well. I'm wondering, do you ever compose with paper and pencil, or do you do all of your work directly on a computer, or do you do some combination of both? Good question. <laughs> I, I would say that um, I've done most in the computer, honestly. Okay. But when I started The Architect, that was completely different because um, the, the goal or the goalpost had, had moved. Um, the, so with Architect, I used... Uh, an orchestrator to basically make this stuff all pretty for string players so that they get in there and play it and understand it. So instead of using, instead of writing just in the computer in a way to make it sound good as a finished piece, the computer really became a mock-up. Hmm. And in order to be able to do that, I did have to go back to paper and pencil. Interesting. Um, it was really time consuming and really hard because I haven't had to do that since college. And that <laughs> college was a long time ago. Hmm. Um, but, but it was good because it forced me to make my ideas concise. And, uh, so I, I would say that I started that off on paper and pencil. And then I, I, after just maybe a week or two, I started to incorporate the computer more, but I had to totally readjust my, um, my workflow. It was a very different workflow. Uh, I'm doing something now that I just started, which is, a. It's a full-length ballet for orchestra, 
that's going to be premiering in London next May, May oh, 2017. Wow, congratulations. How exciting. Thank you. It's a super cool gig. I'm really excited. It's totally outside of my normal world, you know, but <laughs> because it, ha it follows a storyline and because it's for a full orchestra, I'm having to actually do a lot of stuff on paper and the computer. Um, so it's not so much about, is it one or the other? It's about what's the end product and how does your workflow change? Mm. And I, I have a lot of cognitive dissonance around workflow change because I, I, I do things in a certain way and it makes me crazy when I have to change it. So you have growing pains in those days when you're trying to switch how you work. Fascinating. Fascinating. And for an artist, it can be so critical to find the right groove to consistently grow and depend on the creative process to flower. Yes? That's a, that's a, that's a really good way to put it. Um, and, and it's actually, it's a, it's a very poetic way to say that you're sitting here pulling your hair out, trying to figure out <laughs> like, I need to do this. And then step two will be this. And step three will be this and trying to go backwards to using pencil and paper. It is, it's a really good discipline. And I'm glad that I have it in my past because I can call on it, but it's one of those jarring moments of realization of how much we've come to depend on our computers and yes. as composers like that. Wow, if this thing went down, I'm screwed. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also refreshing to know that you can take the simple tools of pencil and paper and know that the creativity is still there, even if you don't have the digital arsenal in front of you. Oh, totally. In fact, um, with the Architect album, the very, the very first piece I started writing that was uh, The Architect, the title mm -hmm. piece. And um, I was on one of my Italy trips, uh, and I was in this church called San Giorgio Maggiore, which is, um, it was built by the architect Andrea Palladio. And he, there's something about his architecture. And I, I actually started writing that piece in the church where I started scribbling out on just a piece of plain paper. Hmm because I got the idea while I was in there just watching, like looking at the lines of everything and sitting there for half hours, staring at the inside of this church, which was so, it's very simple and clean, but some, something about watching the lines of things triggered an idea. Mm, mm.
so that's yeah that's where i'm really glad that i have pencil and paper yeah. and you know what even if you don't have pencil and paper and you get an idea just grab your phone and with the notes thing start singing into it or giving yourself tips because yeah, yeah. i guarantee you that 20 minutes later you're not going to remember what that idea was <laughs> great advice I want to finish off with – in some ways, we've gone a backwards interview. We're going back in time. <laughs> I'm wondering if you That's could sh- – <laughs> I'm wondering if we could close off with some information of where you got your training as a composer. You you'd mentioned that you'd studied the piano and you had studied uh, composition and orchestration. Where did you get your training as a composer? Oh, I didn't. Um, Interesting. I took – you know, I, I took – in college, I took um, – a semester of composition uh, with the composition teacher there. And it, I think with a comp teacher, you, you really need someone who understands what you're about and how, what you want to do. And the guy I studied with, he was, he was really nice. He was very cool, but he was a jazzer. He was like a hardcore jazz guy. And I was a very filmic guy. And um, everything I did, he was like, yeah, man, we got to make this crunchier. It means <laughs> So, and I was like, <laughs> I just want some pretty strings yeah. or like a choir. And so I did it for a semester um, and it, I don't know, I, got, I think the, the thing it did help me with was setting goals for a certain amount of output <laughs> in much the same way that somebody who has a trainer, they go to the gym because they know that the trainer is expecting them to be there. Yeah. And with a comp teacher, it can be that. And they can definitely encourage you to think. I will say that I did think outside of the box because of some of the things he taught me. Um, but otherwise, I just kind of keep doing and doing and never stopping doing. And I listen to a lot of stuff. Um, I just don't have much in the way of formal composition training. Mm. But classically trained as a musician, music history, music theory, form and analysis, counterpoint, the whole shebang. But not anything more than one semester of actual composition lessons. Interesting. So you were a music major, though, or were you a business major, or where did, where did you get your business pedigree? Oh, no, no. I was, um, I was a music major. Okay. Uh, piano performance was my degree. Uh-huh. Out of college, I moved to New York. I landed a job at EMI Music Publishing doing sync licensing. Wow. Um, <clears throat> as the assistant to one of the people there who did a lot. So I did like a lot of the smaller deals. Mm. And then a year later, EMI got the Beatles catalog. They took the Beatles catalog for a five-year thing. So I was 24 years old administering the Beatles catalog for TV uses. cool. Oh, my goodness. A whole nother world. This is just amazing. No, it was crazy. And and a year later, after I'd gotten the ulcer, and I'm not kidding, I got an ulcer over it. Mm. um, That's when a friend of mine who was working at uh, MTV Network said, hey, there's a spot open here. I think you might like it. You should come interview. Neat. And so that's where I ended up. Oh wow! So yeah, with the business part, you really do learn by you learn by doing. I am not a savvy business person in a general sense, like the way an MBA would be. Um, but but the stuff I do, I, I think I know pretty well. And the stuff I don't know, thank God I have a bunch of friends that do. Mm. Carrie, your story has been absolutely inspirational, and what a delight to spend some time getting to know you and sharing your story and your music with our listeners. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Um, this was so much fun to talk about. Uh, <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to carry it on another time. Oh, I hope we can. And you have to definitely keep me updated of any new projects or any new things coming up that perhaps we can get you back on the show to help promote them. Oh, thanks a million, Hugh. I appreciate it. For links to Carrie's music and website, as well as a list of the songs and resources featured in this episode, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter to get the latest updates on my special series on musical entrepreneurs. And if you enjoyed this show, I hope you'll take a moment to post a quick review on iTunes by going to amusicallife.com forward slash review. And don't forget, you can also send me your feedback or your own musical stories by voicemail by going to amusicallife.com and looking for the Send Voicemail tab along the right side of the screen with your smartphone or computer. I'd love to hear from you. And if you're a musician or band, I'd love to help promote your music. Until next time, 
I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.